good catch. Um, Chris and Kathy have been such a huge part of our life. That's just the understatement of, this, of the century. We actually lived together for a season in Weaverville while their home was being built, and it was just such a privilege. When Benny and I moved to Weaverville, um, Chris, oh, Kathy, they were not in the leadership at all of the church. Chris was recovering from a nervous breakdown. Uh, there were a bunch of other leaders, the Dairy Berries, and, uh, who are here. Why, why don't you wave your hand there, Bill and Judy? I, Chris probably wouldn't be alive without these two. Um, they really had such profound impact on all of us, but I know, especially Chris. Um, they, they weren't a part of a leadership team uh, by any means, but Chris just had this passion to learn and a passion to serve. He would stop by the house constantly on the way home from work, asking if there was something he could do. I finally just decided I have to make stuff up. I have to, I have to, just, I have to look for some odd job to give this guy to do because he, he pesters me in a right way, you know, in a godly way, just to serve. And, uh, and that hunger to learn and to serve has just marked their lives to this day. And I'm, I'm, so, I'm so thankful. I just, I can't imagine life without these two. They've had such impact on me and my kids. I, at, at work in Weaverville, if, if I was having a rough time, I would just schedule lunch with Chris because it was almost guaranteed he was having a rougher time. <laughs> and we, we, would, we would sit down to lunch at the mustard seed We'd sit down for, for lunch, and he'd tell me what was going on in the, in the gas station that day or the auto shop or something. And I, we would laugh and laugh and laugh. I'd go back to the office thinking, man, I've got it good. I've just <laughs> I've got it good. Uh, I, and this would happen over and over. I mean, this is 17 years of this stuff, you know. I remember one day coming, uh, having lunch with him and thought I had just heard the ultimate. If you can imagine, he owns a gas station, and there's a car parked against the wall. It's been there for several days, waiting for the time for it to be repaired. And it had been dropped off, and I don't know how long, two or three days it had been there. And it's been there for all that time with no problem. Well, he happens to have a customer who has his car there to be worked on, who doesn't really like Chris, but Chris is the best at what he does. Nobody else near he could fix it, so he brought the car to Chris. So they're standing there talking about the job that needs to be done. And they look over, and this car that's been there for like three days, it just starts backing out of the stall. And they look at it, and the, and the customer says to Chris, I don't think there's anyone driving that. And Chris, of course, is like, it's been there for days, so one of his guys is moving it. And they look, and he says, I don't think anybody's in that car. And they watch the car back down the driveway. Nobody in it. It's been there for days. Back down the driveway, and then turn left and go up the highway. No, nobody's in it and then turn left again and come back up the driveway and run into this customer's car. <laughs> and, and the customer said, I, I w had I not seen it for myself, I never would have believed you. So I would go have lunch just to get laughter relief because certainly he had experienced something worse than I did. And, uh, and it, was, it was fun. We are just really indebted, and we uh, want to just say thanks all week long to you and honor you guys, and thank you so much. 20 years. It's wonderful. Bless them again, would you? Thank you. Yeah. So thankful for you. Um, I've got about an hour-long message that we're going to do in 36 minutes, so listen fast, because I can't go an hour. But uh, grab your Bibles open to the book of Matthew, the 20th chapter. And I'm going to abbreviate some things. Honestly, I, I, uh, I talked a couple of weeks ago about the subject of bitterness. Nice Christmas message. Uh, and I'm <laughs> Merry Christmas, by the way. I'll, I'll, I'll reinterject that phrase now and then just to remind you that I know what season it is, all right? Um, I, I spoke on the subject of bitterness a couple of weeks ago as... Um, the defiling factor. In Hebrews, there's this warning about bitterness, and there's this, Jesus taught and said basically this, you are forgiven as you forgive. So you set the standard for how you are forgiven in your life. And so the issue of bitterness is so uh, destructive in a person's life. 
and I have, I've been wrestling with this uh, as a theme for a season and have felt that this would be the, the right time, even though it's awkward because of the holidays. So just warn all your friends, don't come back during Christmas. Yeah, I'm, I'm kidding. Um, I want to do the second half of that today and talk to you a bit about jealousy. Jealousy, in many ways, is the mother of, of bitterness. And uh, learning to deal with these issues of the heart is, uh, is paramount. Now, bitterness is, uh, is so destructive. It's, somebody once said, bitterness is like drinking poison, hoping it will have a, an effect on the other person. And it's the opposite. It destroys the internal world of an individual. And uh, what I've noticed through pastoral care for the last 45 years is that there are three areas that seem to invite and accelerate demonic activity in a person's life. And those three areas are sexual perversion, any repeated activity. I mean, do you understand that sins start as sin of the flesh and then they move into a sin that is spiritual? where they become demonically inspired and uh, regulated. It's true. Even witchcraft is mentioned as a sin of the flesh in Galatians 5. Witchcraft, you would think that would start off absolutely demonic. It doesn't because witch, witchcraft by nature is manipulation and control. And many parents use manipulation and control to raise kids, not knowing they're actually partnering with the spirit of witchcraft. Politicians do it all the time. And so do pastors and leaders. The issue of manipulation and control is the, is the seedbed for the spirit of witchcraft that eventually becomes this demonically controlling and empowered uh, activity in a person's life. All right, same thing with sexual sin, sexual perversion. I've watched through the years as people have come under this demonic activity in their life through repeated uh, sexual sin. The second one would be uh, drug abuse, but especially there's something about hallucinogenics that open a person up to the spirit world where they become a pawn in, to, to the demonic realm. And the third is bitterness. The two most uh, scary people I've ever known, and as a pastor, you work with a lot of people, sometimes off the streets, especially Weaverville. We were right on, on, on the main, uh, main street, and people would just literally would just pass by and knock on the door and, and ask for help. The two scariest people I ever met, their issue was actually bitterness. They had other issues going on in their life, but they were so possessed and tormented by the spirit of bitterness that uh, it, was, it was frightening. Uh, and, and they both actually ended up in, they're in prison for life uh, for murder because bitterness is murder in diapers. It is undeveloped murder, and that's what it is. And the enemy's attempt is always to get you to destroy somebody else and destroy yourself in the process. So... Merry Christmas, by the way. Just <laughs> interject that now and then to let you know I know what season it is, all right? Now, let's move on. What I'm going to do with this story, I, I really want to come back to this when I can take a good period of time. It might be like a Sunday night where I can take an actual full hour. Um, but I'm going to take a story in Matthew 20, and I'm just going to abbreviate it for you and read the conclusion. This is the story. It's about a landowner and servants. And he hires people uh, from the city square. He would go down to the city square and he would find people that needed jobs and he needed help on his ranch, on his farm. So he'd go down to the city square, he'd get some people and he would hire them. And it was a 12 day, uh, 12 hour work day. And so he would hire these folks for a denarius. They would come to work for him. He went back down, I forget now, after I think uh, the third hour of the day, so there's nine hours left of the work day, and he found some more people that needed work, went back to the ranch. He went back after six hours, etc. And finally, the 11th hour of the day, there's only one more hour to work, he goes back down to the city square and he finds people that still are needing work and he needs help on the ranch. So he gets them, takes them back to the ranch, and at the end of the day, he pays them. And so they're lining up for pay. And uh, if you remember the verse, uh, the last shall be verse, the first shall be last. This is actually one of the contexts in which that phrase was used. So what he did is he brought those who, had, who were hired at the end of the day. He had actually only worked an hour. And he paid them a denarius. Well, everybody else in line thought, well, this is awesome. The landowner, the boss is being generous. He's giving them one denarius. Let's just call it $100. Gives them $100 for their work that day. 
And everyone else is thinking, oh, this is awesome because now we're going to get more. And when he gets down the line and he pays the people that had worked for 12 hours, he gives them $100, the same as everyone else. And they're angry about it. They're upset and angry because they were paid uh, the same as the guy who only worked an hour. And li listen to this concluding verse. It's in verse uh, 15 of Matthew 20. Uh, in fact, let's, let's, uh, let's go back to verse 14. Take what is yours and go your way. I wish to give to this last man the same as you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Or is your eye evil because I am good? Catch that last phrase. Is your eye evil because I am good? Here's the bottom line. Every one of us are in this story either as the favored one or as the friend of the favored one. And the role will change. There will be moments where the spotlight is on you and you get what you know you do not deserve. You will be honored and blessed in a way that you never could have worked for. It's called grace. And there will be other times where your friend gets the very thing you prayed for, the very thing you fasted for. I don't know why it works this way, but it seems that the person who has three cars is always the one that drives into the grocery store as the one millionth customer, and they win a fourth car. And the person who needs the car doesn't have a car and is not the one millionth customer. Don't make me explain that because I don't understand it, but I just know resource attracts resource. Favor attracts favor. And there are moments in our lives where we are the one that are, cho are selected, chosen, and we're the one given the $100 for one hour work instead of 12. Everybody in this room has those moments. It's called grace. It's the way the kingdom works. But the kingdom also works this way, where the guy next to you gets the very thing you prayed for. And here's the question. Is your eye evil because he is good? Let's put it another way. Because of the corruption in your own heart, do you see the goodness of God displayed on another person in a wrong way? Has it distorted your perception of divine favor somewhere else? The real lesson, the real invitation of the Lord is for us to learn to celebrate the breakthroughs, the favor that is shown to another person. Proverbs says, if I don't know how to handle another person's possession, I cannot be entrusted with my own. So let's just take this as the possession of favor. If I cannot celebrate the favor that is put upon Dan, if I can't rejoice in that grace that just rests on him, where he is this uh, amazing, highly favored by everybody I know, if I can't celebrate that that rests on his life, then I am not qualified I don't know if qualified is the right word, but I'll use it. I am not qualified to have the same measure of favor on my life. Why? Because I'll pervert and distort it. If I cannot use somebody else's possession well, I can't be entrusted with my own. In the practical sense, it's the car you rent. People who rent cars treat them much, much worse than if that car were their own personal car. And what it does is in the unseen realm, it restricts the measure and level of personal promotion because we have chosen to abuse what is not ours, therefore restricting ourselves from future promotion. And so another person's favor is to be celebrated. And there are times where the Lord will actually plant somebody in your life and they will receive the thing you've ached for. You maybe have fasted and prayed for it. You've had prophecies about it. You've cried out to God. You've done all this stuff for maybe for years. And then they come in, you know, you, you've been praying for 20 years for this. They come in and six months later, they got it. And there is a, it's called a test. And the test is, is to see how can I manage my heart when somebody else receives easily what I've labored for? And that's the story here. Is your eye evil because he is good? Because this is what happens is when things are not right here, I will distort the circumstances of another person's life and I will twist it for my favor, for my, uh, to, to where I'm the winner in the argument. I'm the winner. And what jealousy does is jealousy, uh, jealousy moves to read other people's motives, to bring accusation in the heart, maybe never out loud, 
But jealousy, l- let me put it this way. Both jealousy and bitterness are reasonable. There are reasons, right? You talk to somebody. I remember wanting to pray for somebody, I, and I could sense something on them. I said, do you need to forgive anyone? And her response was, you don't realize what they did for me. In other words, I have a reason. My reasoning says this is a legitimate response to what was done to me. That reasoning is carnal reasoning. It is unrenewed mind reasoning. It is not biblical reasoning. Biblical reasoning works from the cross towards a situation. Biblical reasoning works from the redemptive work of Jesus towards any broken situation that you and I are involved in. Jealousy causes, uh, uh, enables a person, perverts a perspective in a person's heart to the, where they read motives, wrong motives into another, another person's heart. The way that you walk in forgiveness is stay away from thinking you ever know somebody else's motives. It is forbidden territory. It's, it's no trespassing. I do not have a right to go and say, well, they, they did this because of, I don't have the right to ever do that. Because the Bible says, I can't even know my own heart. What's scary to me is there are people who are confessing Christ that don't read this word. This is a knife that cuts and it cuts to expose. This thought is from God. This thought is not. How does a person live with ample discernment to recognize when we are going into something that is forbidden and no trespassing? and trying to figure out the motives of another person. So the scripture says, I don't even know my own heart. How can I know yours? Well, the Lord showed me. No, he didn't show you because he's a better steward than that. He's not going to reveal the heart to another person that if, that's going to make them bitter. There is someone who will show you their heart, but it's not our Lord. Look at this passage in in, uh, James. In James chapter 3, there's this um, uh, very sobering uh, portion of Scripture. By the way, Merry Christmas to all of you. Glad you're here. Our uh, Bethel TV audience around the world, we're glad you're watching. Merry Christmas. I have not forgotten. James chapter 3, verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your heart, that's self-promotion, In your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, and demonic. Here's what you've got to see. Bitterness and jealousy is wisdom. That's what it says. This wisdom is not from above. That's why those who are steeped in bitterness and jealousy, consider themselves to be right, discerning, accurate. Bitterness and jealousy masquerades as the need for justice. It masquerades under the need for justice. And for that reason, it's biblically called wisdom. It's just wisdom that comes from the demonic realm. The battleground for every one of us, the biggest battleground we face is the mind. It is our, it's our thought world. And uh, perhaps, perhaps a day, I don't know, maybe in the next year sometime, we can take two or three weeks just to work on this one theme, this one idea. If, if you could imagine, uh, 2 Corinthians 10 talks about the pulling down strongholds. And strongholds exist in thought patterns. It's a real abstract 
a picture, an idea, but the concept is very real, very biblical. So imagine this, uh, a, a, an old, uh, in the old days, the big castles. Those castles were places where, where the king and his family could hide out if there was an assault. The soldiers could, could regroup there and, and, and recover their strength and replenish themselves. It was a place of safety, a stronghold. So imagine now this castle is built out of these large stones. And these stones are the illegitimate thoughts and concepts that the enemy raises up to us against other people or against our identity, our destiny, whatever they are. Every one of these stones. And whenever I embrace an illegal thought, let's say it's against an individual. Let's just stick with the theme of bitterness and resentment. If I entertain a thought that accuses somebody that's in my life, what I've done is I've put a stone there. Now, that stone is not a hiding place for the demonic. But if I keep building on it, pretty soon I have a castle in my thinking, a way of wrong thinking in which the demonic hides. And you say, well, Christians can't be that influenced by demons. I, that's just not true. It's not true. It's why Paul had such a strong warning in Ephesians 4, don't give place to the devil. In other words, you could. Don't. Don't do it. Those kinds of, that way of thinking. So when you, when you find that you've been, you've been under delusion about bitterness or resentment, uh, uh, jealousy, those kinds of things, it means that repentance is needed. It means very specific confession of sin. It's not, oh, God, forgive me, I had a bad attitude. Or God, I, I just haven't liked this person, forgive me. Deal with the lies. And the best antidote for lies is truth. Find what God says about a person. This is kind of an awkward story, and I, I, I don't know if it, it, it might make sense to you. It, it, uh, it happened to me several years ago. I was, I was going through one of the uh, Christian magazines, and, and, uh, and it was conference after conference. And, and I, I, what, what I've learned to do is I've learned to, uh, if, if I know something about somebody or I question the integrity of somebody that is very famous. I, I don't sit there and become bitter and accuse. I just turn the page quick. It's, it's just how I avoid the issue. I, just, yeah, I, I don't need to have an opinion about this person. It's my, that's my. But what I saw was, is I saw that I, I was actually, I was, I was succeeding in resisting the spirit of accusation, but I was not succeeding in feeling God's heart for them. The opposite of love is not hate, it's indifference. And I was choosing indifference as the solution for whatever I would question about this individual. All right? And so I went, when I saw what was happening, I went back through the magazine. I, I literally I went through the magazine. I turned page after page. I'd see this conference. And I would stare at the pictures of the people until I could feel God's heart for them. And then I'd turn the page again, and I'd look at the picture. And go, oh, God, this person's so highly favored for a reason. I know they paid a price that I'll never know about, but you favored them because of that. And I'd turn the page. And something began to become activated in me. What you don't want to do is you, you don't want to embrace um, that whole nonsense of knowing somebody else's heart. And it's a huge trap. Once, you, once you've succeeded there, we have to move into a place <clears throat> where we become, we become, we give people the benefit of the doubt. It's, it's a really big part of life for me is I, I see this happen. I hear this happen. You know, the more we travel, the more we rub shoulders with amazing people all over the planet, but occasionally we, we run into a rascal or two. I know it's hard to believe, but it actually happens. There's actually at least two rascals out there. The, the, Chris knows one, I know the other. That's, that's where. And, and to give people the benefit of the doubt, my dad had this saying that's honestly one of the most important phrases I have ever heard in my life. He would tell us, if you wash another person's feet, you'll find out why they walk the way they do. I spent time with some folks that are real rascals. And then I get in and I wash their feet. And I find out what kind of life they've had. I find out that 
They've never had anybody stand with them. I find out all this stuff by just spiritually, if you, if you get, figuratively get the, the metaphor of just serving that person, washing their feet, so to speak. All of a sudden, I find out, oh, this is why they limp. This is why they limp. I, if I had that in my past, I would limp too. Of course, I'd want to be healed. I'd want to be delivered, but at least I understand it. Does that, does that make sense to you? There's something about st- stepping in, into a place of serving and loving people that you question. The third thing that I would say is, uh, is, so, uh, is so critical is, is put the heart of forgiveness, put the favor that you're trying to extend to that individual as much as is possible, put it into an action. Behavior has to be measurable through action. Again, the passage quote, I quote often. If I say I love God whom I can't see and I hate my brother who I can see, I'm a liar. Why? Because I don't have the right to claim an invisible reality that cannot be demonstrated in my behavior in the natural. It has to be verifiable on how I treat the people around me. So here we've got this We've got this issue of jealousy. We've got this, this thing that really becomes the seedbed, the atmosphere for bitterness to actually take over a person's life. So this issue of jealousy is called, according to Scripture, jealousy. This bitter envy is actually reasonable from the demonic realm. So if it makes sense to you, guess where you're thinking from? You're seeing through the situation through the enemy's eyes. It's the only reason it is reasonable. That's where this has to matter. We come before God. We drop to our knees. We say, God, I see this. I, I'm convinced I'm right, and I know I'm not because it's contrary to your word. And we come clean with the Lord, and we, we stay there. And it may be a repeated situation. I remember a situation I had years ago where, my goodness, I must have forgiven the person a hundred times a day, literally, a hundred times a day. It was, I was just being bombarded in my mind. And I would, I would, it was such a fight at work. I would stop. I, 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 I wasn't able to function normally. I was being so bombarded, my mind, my thinking, my emotions. But I, I stuck with it. I make the declaration. I say, no, I have forgiven this person. I refuse to think evil of that person. I will not accuse so-and-so before the Lord. They are a servant of the Lord. They are not my servant. I bless them and then just work to serve that individual. Put, put the forgiveness into some sort of an action so you didn't win the car you needed. Your friend who has three cars now has four. Buy him a tank of gas. Do something. Put it into a practical action because we all need fruit that gives evidence for what's happening in the unseen inside of us. We need fruit. We need, yes, of course you can fake it, but fake it until you get it. Fake it until it's real. Do, do the right thing until it becomes your nature to do the right thing. Jealousy kills people. And I'm saying this to you today because I have sensed that we are in another wave, another season, another wave of promotions. And promotions are wonderful, but they never happen to everybody at once. One of you is going to be the guy that worked for an hour and you get the wages for 12 hours. And you're going to have to deal with the fact that everybody around you, if they operate in ungodly wisdom, are trying to discern what you did to have that kind of favor. How did you manipulate the situation? You never have to apologize or explain the Lord's blessing. When you have favor, live with the favor. Don't be apologetic. I've, I've gotten in a car of a friend of mine before, and he had, uh, it was a beautiful car. He picked me up at the hotel. We were going to a meeting. And as soon as I sat down, he began to apologize for having such a nice car. And I know how awkward he felt. I've, I have felt the same. I, you know, people say, well, you don't deserve that. No, it's true. I, but I, I, don't, I also don't deserve a less, lesser car. Yeah, actually, I, I don't deserve one at all. I don't deserve a bicycle. If I got what I deserved, I'd be walking everywhere I went. You know, that's, that's the bottom line. So everything you do have is by grace. 
So the point is, is he felt this need to apologize and explain, well, the church took an offering. They bought me this car. It was wonderful. I, I was thankful for him. But I felt bad for him at the same time that he was walking through the motions of what I had walked through before. You never have to apologize for the blessing of the Lord. So in this season of promotion, some of you are going to be the one with the wages of a day's work for one hour. And others of you, it's going to be your friend. And you're going to be the one that works so hard for minimum. And it will be your assignment to learn how to move into a place where jealousy has no voice in your heart, no voice in your head, no voice. Truth is what dismantles these blocks that create strongholds that the enemy functions and operates out of. It's revelation truth. There are times where, you know, Philippians 4 talks about thinking on these things, thinking things that are knowable and right and truthful and, and faithful. And all, all, these, all these things are in this list in, in, uh, in Philippians 4, verse 8. He says, think on these things. And I have, I have had times where my mind is being bombarded about a certain individual that has done me wrong or whatever. And, uh, and I, I go to that verse and I say, all right, whatever is true, God, what is there that is absolutely true about that person that I am obviously missing to dwell on this. And I will look for things. I'll ask God. I will pray for things. God, show me what it is that you've done. It's that same thing, looking at the favor, you know, uh, uh, feel, looking to feel the favor of God on that individual on the page. I remember several years back, I was in a, uh, I was in a conference, big conference, and uh, I was on the front row. I was one of the speakers, and, and there was this gal right on the other side of the barrier uh, that was just making all kinds of noise and doing all kinds of unusual things. And, uh, but I, thankfully, I've gone through this about a thousand other times, so I knew not to be accusing in my mind. You need to rejoice with me. I did not sin. I, I, just, I just want you to know I succeeded. I did not have a bad attitude, but it sure was annoying. And then Heidi comes over, she stands, Heidi Baker's there, she stands next to me, she says, isn't this wonderful? And I, yeah, it is. And then she mentioned, yeah, I said, she uh, was a prostitute for 30 some years and now she's free. And all of a sudden, all that noise that seems so awkward, seems so reasonable. Yeah, she's free. That's right. You can have the microphone, you know, demonstrate what liberty looks like to the rest of us that have just become too accustomed to freedom. The Christmas verse. Merry Christmas, by the way. The Christmas verse that's been on my mind since a week or so, last week or so, has been in Romans 8, where it says, all creation groans and travails for the revealing of the sons and daughters of God. Why would they be interceding for that? Because they've already seen it once. They were here when the Son of God was manifest. Creation itself cooperated to point to this Messiah, Jesus. The star in the sky revealed the nature and the source of this one who was sent from heaven. But now today, creation itself groans, prays for, if you will, the revelation of the children of God. The context is freedom, and there's no freedom where there's jealousy. There's no freedom where there's bitterness. There's no freedom. See, do, do you know what free, uh, uh, bitterness, jealousy, and regret all are addicted to the past? They all have a similar effect on the soul of a person, have a similar effect on the emotional condition, the mental condition. And I'll tell you what, the enemy... Fears, and, and, and I don't think I can say this strong enough, he fears your freedom because in our freedom, there is such a creative expression 
of what God is wanting to do in the earth that we reveal him through our liberty, through our freedom, through our creative expression. There's very strong biblical basis for this, this concept of freedom, that the artisans were the, the ones that God raised up in the last days with creative expression to war against the four beasts, that, the horns that warred against the saints. The whole point was God's solution for restriction, bondage, resentment, bitterness, all this stuff, was a people that were free. And the result of their freedom was that they creatively represented him in the earth to where all of creation itself steps into a liberty because the people of God are free. And the people of God are free when we deal with the issues of jealousy and bitterness, regret, all these things that link us to things that are already under the blood. We've been invited, we've been commanded to step into this liberty because creation itself longs for the accurate representation of who he is through our freedom. The greatest freedom that anybody could ever experience is the freedom that a person receives when they surrender their life to the only one who has the right to run my life. And that's Jesus, the Christ, the King, the Lord, the Master. He has the right to run it. And that he chooses to co-labor with us. He forgives us. And he becomes the loving expression of a father. He becomes the one who tutors and mentors and cares for and brings us into layer after layer of liberty and freedom. And that liberty and freedom is available for everyone who's watching on Bethel TV, everybody who's in this room, anyone in any overflow room, that freedom is available. And I want to do just one thing. I want to just ask the question, is there anyone here today that would just say, Bill, I don't want to leave the building until I know that I've been forgiven by God himself, that I've been brought into his family, that I can finally be a true disciple, a follower of Jesus. If there's anybody in the room in that condition, you'd say, Bill, I don't want to leave until I know that's settled. I want you just to put a hand up in the air, right over here. Yep. Anybody else? Put your hand up high. Yep. There's another, another one over here. Wonderful. Welcome, welcome, welcome. It's beautiful. Beautiful. Anybody else? Just wave it if I don't see you. Sometimes, sometimes it's hard to see. All right. This is wonderful. and We celebrate this. Um, it's the greatest miracle of all that a person can be changed in a moment, forgiven of sin, given the actual nature of Christ, filled with the Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. That's about to happen in these people's lives. I want to ask you to stand, and I want to ask ministry team people to quickly come to the front, and we're going to pray together. I want to ask these two to raise your hands. If you would do yourself and me a favor, Come right over here to the people in front of this banner, right here. Right over here to my left, right here. Just come down, and, uh, and they will serve you. They will minister to you. They will pray with you. Now, I want you just to hold your hands in front of you. I want to just, this kind of just represents our, we're holding on to our life here. So hold it before the Lord. I want to pray. Father, I ask that you would give such an unusual anointing and grace to this church family to not be bound by yesterday, to be free from every trace of jealousy, every trace of resentment, every trace of regret, that true liberty would be demonstrated in the life of this family. I ask this in Jesus' name. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Now, some of you need prayer for a miracle in your body. Some of you have issues. You just need someone to stand with you in prayer. Uh, maybe from what I talked about today, we've got a team down here today that would love to talk with you. Tonight, you must be back here tonight. You just must be. David Hogan is here. Wow. Wow. It's going to be awesome. Can we give Pastor Bill a big hand? Isn't that amazing? Uh, 
I thought that was an appropriate Christmas message because he's helping us all get healthy as we step into family at another level. Amen? Hey, God bless you guys. Have a great day. If you need prayer for anything, come on up front. And uh, we're going to see miracles happen and just God's going to move. It's going to be great. Have a wonderful day.